of extra. We had a, we had a short story, didn't know what to do with it, anyway. I gave it to her. And I thought no more of it. I thought it was just between us. And she, she uh, read it and I gave it to my father and he said, well, I like this. So uh, she said, I'm going to get in touch with his agent. The next thing I knew, uh, my agent came over to Ireland from London and um, there was all this sort of simpering and secret smiling going on. I thought, what the hell are they cooking up? Anyway, he took it back with him to London, and the uh, next thing I, they, they said, the, 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 your publisher want to publish it as a separate short story, just uh, a slim little thing for the Christmas market next Christmas. Is it something you actually wrote on Christmas? It was, I written Christmas Day, and it was <laughs> published uh, for the following Christmas Day, Christmas of 75. And, it's been sort of a, a kind of a Christmas story ever since. Well, for sure, for us it has been. I, I, tell me what inspired the story. I mean, you yourself had been a Royal Air Force pilot when you were at the tender age of 19. Is that what inspired you to write this story? It, it was sort of that, yes. I mean, basically, it was, she had mockingly challenged me to write her a ghost story. And uh, I'd never, it wasn't my kind of stuff. I don't do ghost stories, you know, I, I do it sort of. Uh, political thrillers. So um, I thought, what on earth? They have a ghost story. You know, it's all it's all old manor houses and and, and uh, sort of spooks that go through walls and rattling chains and people with their head under their arm and all that sort of stuff. And I thought that's a very very kind of samey to write another one with an old manor house and stone steps and creaking doors and all that stuff. So then uh, I thought, well, you know, let's set something in the more modern era. I thought, what, you know, what, how about a, a Second World War pilot? And uh, so uh, darkness settled on the hotel. It was obviously Christmas Day. Everybody pretty believed it was freezing cold outside. It was pitch black. And I was sitting in this little writing room in this hotel, and I thought, it's getting <laughs> spookier and spookier. <laughs> what about the pilot? That was the night sky. I said, I wonder, you know. And then it came out of that, really. That was the way it was born. It was born by staring at a night sky. Uh, in the middle of winter and uh, imagining a pilot up there uh, lost and um, kind of screaming for help. But you, now you say that it's not your, in your usual style, I mean, that you're, you write thrillers, and, but this is an extremely suspenseful story. It does have all the drama and intrigue of your novels. Do, don't you feel that? Well, well, I was trying to say so. <laughs> I mean, considering how short it is, it's only, uh, I think, around 10,000 words as opposed to a normal novel of 140,000, I suppose, so it's short. Um, but in that, in that area, I tried to, I wanted to get a, a kind of, you know, what will happen next atmosphere. Um, and uh, uh, um, with a sort of sting in the tail sort of thing. Like, like the books, like the, the books are supposed to have a kind of sting in the tail. And uh, so that, that was, you know, why I thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have a little bit of tension, a little bit of surprise, and, and the old uh, twist in the tail, we'll just do it, do, it, do it in miniature. So it's a kind of novel in miniature. Why do you think uh, that still, over all the decades, people can actually listen to this story over and over again? The, our, our listeners get this reading every year, and they... Every year, we by November, they're starting to ask us what date it's going to be on. What, what do you think it is about it? You know, I really don't know. I think yours must be the only broadcasting service I know who, who does use it as a kind of regular chestnut. Um, I'm, I'm very glad of that, because obviously it was designed as a Christmas story, and I deliberately put in the allegory of the shepherd. I mean, Jesus being, so to speak, the shepherd. And that's why, uh, you know, these rescue... <laughs> And I just thought, you know, it's 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 uh, it's about Christmas, and it's 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 all there, and I think it just pleases me very much that people, you know, even though they must know the answer, they must know the, uh, you know, the, the, how it ends. <laughs> the at the end, they must know all that, how they still continue to like it. It's very pleasing. What, now, last time we talked, you ha there was an idea that there might be uh, a, a movie version or a TV version. Has there been any other discussions about making the making the it into that? No, it seems to have some kind of a jinx on it. it I've, I've had approach after approach after approach, and uh, it, I think it's been scree scripted rather well, sort of screenplayed about seven or eight times, and then to turn around, it goes yet again.
And I thought at first it's probably because it would be very costly, you know. Now we have computer simulation. It can actually be done much, much more cheaply because you really do not need the night sky. You just need an empty warehouse uh, and uh, computer generation of images. But anyway, there it is. It's still out there. It's still unmade. And uh, I think it was 12 months ago was the last uh, attempt to offer, but it fell through. Now, why don't you, I mean, would you actually do us a great honor if you could uh, read uh, the opening of the story for this year's audience. Would you, would you do that for us? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, it, be it begins very ban ban in a very banal manner with a young pilot preparing for takeoff. For a brief moment, while waiting for the control tower to clear me for takeoff, I glanced out to the perspex cockpit canopy at the surrounding German countryside. It lay white and crisp beneath the crackling December moon. Behind me lay the boundary fence of the Royal Air Force Base. Far away to my right, the airfield tower stood up like a glowing candle. Inside the tower, I knew all was warmth and merriment, the staff waiting only for my departure to close down and head back to the parties in the mess. Within minutes of my going, the lights would die out, leaving only the flickering red station light beating out in Morse code the name of the station, C-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, to an unheeding sky. For tonight, there would be no wandering aviators to look down and check their bearings. Tonight was Christmas Eve in 1957, and I was a pilot trying to get home for Christmas. My watch read 10.15 by the dim blue glow of the control panel where the rows of dials quivered and danced. It was warm and snug inside the cockpit. The heating turned up full to prevent the perspex icing up. It was like a cocoon, small and warm and safe, shielding me from the bitter cold outside, from the freezing night that can kill a man inside a minute if he's exposed to it at 600 miles per hour. Charlie Delta, clear takeoff. The controller's voice, sounding in my headphones, woke me. I eased the throttle forward slowly with the left hand, holding the vampire steady down the central line with the right hand. Behind me, the low whine of the goblin engine rose into a scream. The snub-nosed fighter rolled, the lights each side of the runway passed till they were flashing in a continuous blur. As the end of the runway whizzed beneath my feet, I pulled the vampire into a gently climbing turn. Down on my right thigh was strapped the map with my course charted on it in blue ink, but I did not need it. I knew the details by heart. Turn overhead, Sally Airfield, onto course, 265 degrees, continue climbing to 27,000 feet. On reaching height, maintain course and keep speed at 485 knots. Check in with Channel D, the RAF's North German Air Control Frequency, to let them know you're in their airspace. Then, a straight run over the Dutch coast and the North Sea. After 44 minutes flying time, change to Channel F and call Lake and Heath Control to give you a steer. Fourteen minutes later, you'll be overhead Lake and Heath. After that, follow instructions and they'll bring you down on a radio-controlled descent. Sixty-six minutes flying time with the descent and landing, and the vampire had enough fuel for over eighty minutes in the air. From Lake and Heath, I knew I could get a lift down to London after midnight. By breakfast time, I begin my parents' home in Kent, celebrating with my own family. The altimeter read 27,000 feet. I eased the nose forward, reduced throttle setting to give me an airspeed of 485 knots and held her steady on 265 degrees. Somewhere beneath me, the Dutch border would be slipping away and I had been airborne for 21 minutes. All well. The problem started 10 minutes out over the North Sea and it started so quietly that it was several minutes before I realized I had one at all. The first warning I had was when I flicked a glance downward to check my course on the compass. Instead of being rock steady on 265 degrees, the needle was drifting lazily round the clock. I swore a most unseasonal sentiment against the compass and the instrument fitter who should have checked it. Still, it was not too serious. There was a standby compass, the alcohol kind. But when I glanced at it, the needle was swinging wildly too. Apparently something had jarred the case, which isn't uncommon. In any event, I could call up Lake and Heath in a few minutes, and they'd give me a GCA, a ground-controlled approach. The second-by-second second instructions a well-equipped airfield can give a pilot to bring him home in the worst of weathers. I glanced at my watch. Thirty-four minutes airborne. Before trying Lake and Heath, the correct procedure would be to inform Channel D, to which I was tuned, of my little problem, so they could advise Lake and Heath that I was on my way without a compass. 
I pressed the transmit button, but instead of the lively crackle of static and the sharp sound of my own voice coming back into my own ears, there was a muffled murmur inside my oxygen mask, my own voice speaking and going nowhere. The radio was dead. Fighting down the rising sense of panic, I swallowed and slowly counted to ten. Then I switched to channel F and tried to raise Lakenheath, but the steady whistle of my own jet engine behind me was my only answer. While I was vainly testing my radio channels, my eyes scanned the instrument panel in front of me. The instruments told their own message. It was no coincidence the compass and the radio had failed together. Both worked off the aircraft's electrical circuits. Somewhere beneath my feet, amid the miles of brightly colored wiring that make up the circuits, there had been a main fuse blowout. The first thing to do in such a case, I remembered old Flight Sergeant Norris telling us, is to reduce throttle setting to give maximum flight endurance. We don't want to waste valuable fuel, do we, gentlemen? We might need it later. So we reduce the power setting from 10,000 revolutions per minute to 7,200. That way we will fly a little slower, but we will stay in the air rather longer, won't we, gentlemen? I eased the throttle back and watched the rev counter. It operates on its own generator, and so I hadn't lost that at least. I waited until the goblin was turning over at about 7,200 RPM and felt the aircraft slow down. The main instruments in front of a pilot's eyes are six, including the compass. The five others are the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, the vertical speed indicator, the bank indicator, which tells him if he's turning to left or to right, and the slip indicator, which tells him if he's skidding crabwise across the sky. Two of these are electrically operated, and they had gone the same way as my compass. That left me with the three pressure-operated instruments, airspeed indicator, altimeter, and vertical speed indicator. I knew how fast I was going, how high I was, and if I were either diving or climbing. It is perfectly possible to land an aircraft with only these three instruments, judging the rest by those old navigational aids, the human eyes. Possible, that is, in conditions of brilliant weather, by daylight and with no cloud in the sky. By night, it is not possible. The only things that show up at night, even on a bright moonlight night, are the lights. These have patterns when seen from the sky. I knew Norwich very well, and if I could identify the great curving bulge of the Norfolk coastline, I could find Norwich, the only major sprawl of light set 20 miles inland from the coast. Five miles north of the city, I knew, was the fighter airfield of Miriam St. George, whose red indicator beacon would be blipping out its Morse identification signal into the night. I began to let the vampire down slowly toward the oncoming coast. As the fighter slipped toward Norfolk, the sense of loneliness gripped me tighter and tighter. The night sky, its stratospheric temperature fixed, night and day alike, at an unchanging minus 56, became in my mind a timeless prison creaking with the cold. Below me lay the worst of them all, the heavy brutality of the North Sea, waiting to swallow me and my plane and bury us in a liquid black crypt. At 15,000 feet, and still diving, I began to realize that a fresh enemy had entered the field. Far away, to right and left, ahead and no doubt behind me, the light of the moon reflected on a flat and endless sea of white. The East Anglian fog had moved in. There was no question of trying to overfly the fog to westward. Without navigational aids or radio, I'd be lost over strange, unfamiliar country. Also, out of the question was to try to fly back to Holland. I had not the fuel. Relying only on my eyes to guide me, it was a question of landing at Miriam St. George or dying amid the wreckage of the vampire somewhere in the fog-wreathed fens. At 10,000 feet, I pulled out of my dive, increasing power slightly to keep airborne, using up more of my precious fuel. Still, a creature of my training, I recalled again the instructions of Flight Sergeant Norris. When we are totally lost above unbroken cloud, gentlemen, we must consider the necessity of bailing out of our aircraft, must we not? Of course, Sergeant. Unfortunately, the single-seat vampire is notoriously difficult to bail out of. What else, Sergeant? Our first move, therefore, is to turn our aircraft toward the open sea, away from all areas of intense human habitation. The procedures were well worked out. They did not mention that the chances of a pilot bobbing about on a winter's night in the North Sea were one in a hundred of living more than half an hour. One last procedure, gentlemen, to be used in extreme emergency. That's better, Sergeant Norris. That's what I'm in now. All aircraft approaching Britain's coasts are visible on the radar scanners of our early warning system. 
If, therefore, we have lost our radio and cannot transmit our emergency, we try to attract the attention of our radar scanners by adopting an odd form of behavior. We do this by moving out to sea, then flying in small triangles, turning left, left, and left again, each leg of the triangle being of a duration of two minutes flying time. In this way, we hope to attract attention. When we have been spotted, the air traffic control is informed and he diverts another aircraft to find us. When discovered by the rescue aircraft, we formate on him and he brings us down through the cloud or fog to a safe landing. Yes, it was the last attempt to save one's life. I recall the details better now. The rescue aircraft which would lead you back to a safe landing, flying wingtip to wingtip, was called the Shepherd. I glanced at my watch. 51 minutes airborne, about 30 minutes left of fuel. I pulled the vampire into a left-hand turn and began my first leg of the first triangle. Below me, the fog reached back as far as I could see, and ahead toward Norfolk, it was the same. Ten minutes went by, nearly two complete triangles. I had not prayed, not really prayed, for many years, and the habit came hard. Lord, please get me out of this bloody mess. When I had been airborne for 72 minutes, I knew no one would come. I felt the rage of despair welling up. I began screaming into the dead microphone, You bastards! Why don't you look at your radar screens? Why can't somebody see me? All so damn drunk you can't do your jobs properly. The anger subsides. Five minutes later, I knew that I was going to die that night. Strangely, I wasn't even afraid anymore. Just enormously sad. It's a bad thing to die at 20 years of age with your life unlived, and the worst thing is not the fact of dying, but the fact of all the things never done. I dropped the left wing of the vampire toward the moon to bring the aircraft onto the final leg of the last triangle. Down below the wingtip, against the sheen of the fog bank, a black shadow crossed the whiteness. It was another aircraft, low against the fog bank, keeping station with me through my turn, a mile down through the sky toward the fog. Being below me, I kept turning, wing down to keep it in sight. The other aircraft also kept turning until the two of us had done one complete circle. Only then did I realize why he did not climb to my height and take up station on my wingtip. I eased the throttle back and began to slip down toward him. He kept turning. So did I. At 5,000 feet, I knew I was still going too fast for him. To reduce speed even more, I put out the air brakes, slowing down to 280 knots. Then he was with me. 100 feet off my wingtip, and we straightened out together, rocking as we tried to keep formation. The moon was to my right, and my own shadow masked his shape and form. Even so, I could make out the shimmer of two propellers whirling through the sky ahead of him. Of course, he could not fly at my speed. I was in a jet fighter, he in a piston-engined aircraft of an earlier generation. He held station alongside me for a few seconds, then banked gently to the left. I followed, keeping formation with him, for he was obviously the shepherd sent up to bring me down, and he had the compass and the radio, not I. For the first time, I could see him well. To my surprise, my shepherd was a de Havilland mosquito, a fighter-bomber of World War II vintage. And then I remembered that the meteorological squadron at Gloucester used mosquitoes to help in the preparation of weather forecasts. Inside the cockpit of the mosquito, I could make out against the light of the moon, the muffled head of its pilot, and the twin circles of his goggles as he looked out the side window toward me. Carefully, he raised his right hand till I could see it in the window. Fingers straight, palm downwards. He jabbed the fingers forward and down, meaning, We are going to descend, formate on me. I nodded and quickly brought up my own left hand so he could see it, pointing forward to my own control panel with one forefinger, then holding up five splayed fingers. Finally, I drew my hand across my throat. By common agreement, this sign means I have only five minutes fuel left, then my engine cuts out. I saw the muffled, goggled, oxygen-masked head nod in understanding. Then we were heading downward toward the sheet of fog. He pulled out at 300 feet. The fog was still below us. I could imagine the stream of GCA instructions coming from the radar hut into the earphones of the man flying beside me. I kept my eyes on him, afraid of losing sight, watching for his every hand signal. Two minutes later, he held up his clenched left fist in the window and opened the fist to splay all five fingers against the glass. Please lower your undercarriage. I moved the lever downward and felt the dull thunk as all three wheels went down. In the moonlight, I caught sight of the nose of the mosquito. It had the letters J.K. painted on it, large and black. 
probably for call sign Jig King. He leveled out just above the fog layer, so low the tendrils of candy floss were lashing at our fuselages, and we went into a steady circular turn. I glanced at my fuel gauge. It was on zero, flickering feebly. For God's sake, hurry up, I prayed. I saw his left hand flash the dive signal to me. Then he dipped toward the fog bank. I followed, and we were in it. The visibility was down to near zero. No shape, no size, no form, no substance. Except that off my left wingtip, now only 40 feet away, was the form of a mosquito flying with absolute certainty towards something I could not see. Only then did I realize he was flying without lights. For a second I was amazed, horrified by my discovery. Then I realized the wisdom of the man. Lights in fog are treacherous, hallucinatory, mesmeric. You can be attracted to them, not knowing whether they are 40 or 100 feet away from you. The tendency is to move toward them. For two aircraft in the fog, flying formation, that could easily spell disaster. Without warning, the shepherd pointed a single forefinger at me, then forward through the windscreen. It meant, there you are, fly on and land. I stared forward through the now streaming windshield. Nothing. Then, yes, something. A blur to the left. Another to the right, then two, one on each side. Ringed with haze, there were lights on either side of me in pairs flashing past. I forced my eyes to see what lay between them. Nothing. Blackness. Then, a streak of paint running under my feet. The center line. Frantically, I closed down the power and held her steady, praying for the vampire to settle. Bang, we touched. Bang, bang, another touch. She was drifting again, inches above the wet black runway. Bam, 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 rumble, rumble. She was down. The main wheels had stuck and held. Slowly the vampire came to a stop. I found both of my hands clenched round the control column, squeezing the brake lever inward. I forget now how many seconds I held them there before I would believe we were stopped. There was no need to turn off the engine. It had finally run out of fuel as the vampire careered down the runway. I shut off the remaining systems and slowly began to unstrap myself from the seat. As I did so, to my left, through the fog, no more than 50 feet away, the mosquito roared past me. I caught the flash of the pilot's hand on the side window, and then he was gone, up into the fog, before he could see my answering wave of acknowledgement. But I'd already decided to call up Gloucester and thank him personally. I expected the control tower truck to be alongside in seconds, for with an emergency landing even on Christmas Eve, the fire truck, ambulance, and half a dozen other vehicles were always standing by. Eventually, two headlights came groping out of the mist and stopped 20 feet away. A voice called, Hello there! I stepped out of the cockpit, jumped from the wing to the tarmac and ran toward the lights. At the wheel of the car was a puffed, beardy face and a handlebar mustache. That yours? He nodded toward the dim shape of the vampire. Yes, I said. Yes, I just landed it. Extraordinary, he said. Quite extraordinary. You'd better jump in. I'll run you back to the mess. As we moved away from the vampire, I saw that I had stopped 20 feet short of a plowed field at the very end of the runway. You're damned lucky, shouted. And he seemed to be having trouble with the foot controls. Judging by the smell of whiskey on his breath, that wasn't surprising. Damn lucky, I agreed. I ran out of fuel just as I was landing. My radio and all the electrical systems failed nearly 50 minutes ago over the North Sea. He digested the information carefully. Huh? No radio? No radio, I said. A dead box in all channels. Then, then how did you find this place, he said. I was guided in, I explained patiently. They sent up a shepherd aircraft to bring me down. It was one of the weather aircraft from RAF Gloucester. Obviously, he had radio, so we came in here in formation on GCA. Then when I saw the lights at the threshold of the runway, I landed myself. The man was obviously dense, as well as drunk. Extraordinary, he said. We don't have a GCA. We don't have any navigational equipment at all, not even a beacon. Now it was my turn to let the information sink in. This isn't RAF Miriam St. George? No, I said. This is RAF Minton. I've never heard of it. I'm not surprised. We're not an operational station. Haven't been for years. Minton's a storage depot. He stopped the car and got out. 
I saw we were standing a few feet from the dim shape of a control tower adjoining a long row of Nissan huts, evidently once flight rooms, navigational and briefing huts. The man returned and climbed shakily back behind the wheel. Just turn the runway lights off, he said, and he belched. My mind was whirling. Why did you switch them on, I asked. Well, it was the sound of your engine, he said. I was in the office's mess having a noggin. and old Joe suggested I listen out the window for a second. You sounded damn low, almost as if you were going to come down in a hurry. Thought I might be of some use. Remember, they never disconnected the old runway lights when they dismantled the station, so I ran down the control tower and switched them on. I see, I said. But I didn't. Where is RAF Minton exactly, I asked him. Five miles in from the coast, he said. And where's the nearest operational RAF station with all the radio aids, including GCA? Well, he thought for a moment. Mm, must be Miriam St. George, he said. Mind you, I'm just a store's Johnny. That was the explanation. My unknown friend in the weather plane had been leading me straight in from the coast of Miriam St. George. By chance, abandoned old stores depot Minton lay right along the in-flight path to Miriam's runway, and this old fool had switched on his lights as well. Result, coming in on the last ten-mile stretch, I had plonked my vampire down into the wrong airfield. I was about to tell him not to interfere with modern procedures that he couldn't understand when I choked the words back. My fuel had run out halfway down the runway. I'd never have made Miriam ten miles away. I'd have crashed in the field short of the touchdown. We stopped at the officer's mess and went in. The place had seen better days. My host, Flight Lieutenant Marks, shrugged off his sheepskin coat and threw it over a chair. I'm sorry it's not very hospitable, old boy, said Marks, going to the door and shouting for someone called Joe. Not to worry, I said, though I could do with a bath and a meal. Well, I think we can manage that, he said, trying hard to play the genial host. I can sort of fix up a spare room. God knows we have enough of them. He'll also ruffle up a meal. Bacon and eggs do? That'll do fine. While I'm waiting, do you mind if I use your phone? He ushered me into the mess secretary's office and then went off to supervise the steward. My watch told me it was close to midnight. Hell of a way to spend Christmas, I thought. Then I recalled how 30 minutes earlier I had been crying to God for help, and I felt ashamed. After a few minutes, the phone was ringing. I am here in St. George. Duty controller, air traffic control, please, I said. There was a pause. I'm sorry, sir, but I'm afraid there's no flying tonight, sir. No one on duty in air traffic control. Then give me the station duty officer, please. When I got through to him, I explained about the emergency and that his station had been alerted to receive a vampire fighter coming in on emergency landing without radio. He listened attentively. I don't know about that. I don't think we've been operational since we closed down at five this afternoon. But I'm not on air traffic. I'll get the wing commander flying. An older voice came on the line. Where are you speaking from? RAF Minton, sir. I've just made an emergency landing here. I thought I was heading for your airfield on a ground-controlled approach. Well, make up your mind. Where are you or aren't you? You ought to know. I took a deep breath and started at the beginning. So you see, sir, I was intercepted by the weather plane from Gloucester, and he brought me in. But in this fog, it must have been on a GCA, no other way to get down. Yet when I saw the lights of Minton, I landed, assuming it to be Miriam St. George. I'm ringing to alert you to stand down your radar and air traffic control crews, sir. They must be waiting for a vampire that's never going to arrive. It's already arrived here at Minton. But we shut all the systems down at five o'clock. There's been no call for us to turn up. But Miriam St. George has a GCA. I know we have, but it's been shut down since five o'clock. I ask the next and last question slowly and carefully. Do you know, sir, where is the nearest RAF station that maintains 24-hour emergency listening? Yes. To the west, RAF Barham. To the south, RAF Lincoln Heath. Good night to you. Happy Christmas. I put the phone down. Marham was 40 miles away on the other side of Norfolk. Lake and Heath was well over 40 miles to the southwest, in Suffolk. On the fuel I was carrying, not only could I not have made Miriam St. George, it wasn't even open. 
It began to dawn on me that I didn't really owe my life to the weather pilot from Gloucester, but to beery, bumbling old passed-over Flight Lieutenant Marks, who couldn't tell one end of an aircraft from another. Still, the Mosquito must be back at Gloucester by now, and he ought to know that despite everything, I was alive. Gloucester, said the operator, at this time of night? Yes, I replied firmly. Gloucester, even at this time of night. The duty meteorologist took the call and I explained the position to him. I am afraid there must be some mistake, flying officer, he said. It could not have been one of ours. Our mosquitoes went out of service three months ago. We now use pen bearers. I stared at the telephone in disbelief. Then an idea came to me. What happened to them? They were scrapped, I think, or sent off to museums, more likely. Could one of them been sold privately, I asked. Well, I suppose it's possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And happy Christmas. I put the phone down and shook my head in bewilderment. What an incredible night. First, I lose my radio and all my instruments. Then I get lost and short of fuel. Then I'm taken in tow by some moonlighting harebrain with a passion for veteran aircraft, flying his own mosquito through the night, who happens to spot me, comes within an inch of killing me, and finally a half-drunk ground-duty officer has the sense to put his runway lights on in time to save me. Luck doesn't come in much bigger slices. Flight Lieutenant Marks put his head through the doorway. Your room is ready, he said. Number 17, just down the corridor. Joe's making up a fire. Bath water's heating. If you don't mind, I think I'll turn in. Will you be all right on your own? Yes, sure, I'll be fine. Many thanks for all your help. I took my helmet and wandered down the corridor. From the doorway of 17, a bar of light shone into the passage. As I entered the room, an elderly man began to rise from his knees in front of the fireplace. Good evening, sir, I said. I'm Joe, sir, the mess steward. Yes, Joe, Mr. Marks told me about you. Sorry to cause you so much trouble at this hour of the night. I, I just dropped in, as you might say. Yes, Mr. Marks told me. I'll have your room ready directly. Soon as this fire burns up, it'll be quite cozy. While well, I ate the plate of sizzling bacon and eggs, the old steward stayed to talk. You've been here long, Joe, I asked him, more out of politeness than genuine curiosity. Oh, yes, sir. Nigh on twenty years now. Since just before the war, when the station opened. He told me of the days when the rooms were crammed with eager young pilots, the dining room noisy, the bar roaring with body songs of months and years, when the sky above the airfield snarled to the sound of piston engines, driving planes to war and bringing them back again. I rose from the table, fished a cigarette from the pocket of my flying suit, lit it, and sauntered around the room. The steward began to tidy up the plates. I halted before an old photograph in a frame standing on the mantel above the crackling fire. I stopped with my cigarette half raised to my lips, feeling the room go suddenly cold. The photo was old, but it was still clear enough. It showed a young man in his early twenties, dressed in flying gear, but not the grey suits and plastic crash helmets of today. He wore thick, sheepskin-lined boots, rough serge trousers, and a heavy sheepskin zip-up jacket. From his left hand dangled one of the soft leather flying helmets they used to wear, with goggles attached instead of the modern pilot's tinted visor. He stood with legs apart, right hand on hip, a defiant stance, but he was not smiling. There was something sad about his eyes. Behind him stood his aircraft. There was no mistaking the lean, sleek silhouette of the Mosquito fighter bomber. I was about to say something to Joe when I felt the gust of cold air in my back. One of the windows had blown open. It took me two strides to cross to where the window swung on its steel frame. To get a better hold, I stepped inside the curtain and stared out. Somewhere, far away in the fog, I thought I heard the snarl of engines. But it was probably just a motorcycle of some farm boy. I closed the window, made sure it was secure, and turned back into the room. Who's the pilot, Joe? I nodded toward the lonely photograph on the mantel. That's a photo of Mr. John Cavanaugh, sir. He was here during the war, sir. An Irish gentleman, very fine man, if I may say so. As a matter of fact, sir, this was his room. What squadron was that, Joe? I was still peering at the aircraft in the background. Pathfinder, sir. Mosquitoes, they flew. Very fine pilots, all of them, sir. But I believe... Mr. Johnny was the best of them all. But then I'm biased, sir. 
I was his Batman, you see. There was no doubting it. The faint letters on the nose of the mosquito behind the figure in the photo read J.K. Not Jig King, but Johnny Kavanaugh. The whole thing was clear as day. Kavanaugh had been a fine pilot, flying with one of the crack squadrons during the war. After the war, he'd made a pile of money, bought an old mosquito in one of the periodic auctions of obsolescent aircraft, refitted it, and flew it privately whenever he wished. Not a bad way to spend your spare time if you had the money. So, he'd been flying back from some trip to Europe, but spotted me turning in triangles above the cloud bank, realized I was stuck and taken me in tow. Pinpointing his position precisely by crossed radio beacons, knowing this stretch of the coast by heart, he'd taken a chance on finding his old airfield at Minton, even in the thick fog. It was a hell of a risk. But then, I had no fuel left, so it was that or bust. I had no doubt I could trace the man, probably through the Royal Aero Club. He was certainly a good pilot, I said reflectively, thinking of this evening's performance. Oh, the best, sir, said old Joe. They reckon he had eyes like a cat, did Mr. Johnny. I recall many's a time the squadron return. He'd have his mosquito refueled and take off again alone, going back over the channel of the North Sea to see if he could find some crippled bomber making for the coast and guide home. I've seen pictures of them, I said. And he used to guide them back. I could imagine them in my mind's eye. Gaping holes in the body, the wings and the tail, creaking and swaying as the pilot sought to hold them steady for home. A wounded or dying crew on the radio shot to bits. I turned from the photograph and stubbed my cigarette butt into the ashtray by the bed. Quite a man, I said, and I meant it. Even today, middle-aged, he was a superb flyer. Oh, yes, sir. Quite a man, Mr. Johnny. I nodded gravely. The old man so obviously worshipped his wartime officer. Well, I said, by the look of it, he's still doing it. Now Joe smiled. Oh, oh, I hardly think so, sir. My Johnny went out on his last patrol Christmas Eve, 1943, just a mile over 14 years ago tonight. He never come back, sir. Went down with his plane somewhere in the North Sea, he did. Good night, sir. Uh, happy Christmas. That is the inimitable Alan Maitland, previous co-host of As It Happens, otherwise known as Fireside Al, with his timeless reading of Frederick Forsythe's The Shepherd. Next Wednesday, we're going to look back at some of the most memorable and unusual stories that we heard on the program over the past year. Today, we Quite thought story, we'd huh? your appetite by revisiting the remarkable story of Calgary native Andrew Brash.